yeah. Oh, oh, oh. What happened? <laughs> What's happening, my brother? Over here, fresh go. Uh, uh, you know it. <laughs> Gremlin, that's yeah, what we man. do, it's baby. Funny, do to you. Yeah, yeah. What's up? Good, man. Okay. Uh, that's all I asked for. Yes, sir. That's all I asked for, my dog. I love it. Oh, I love the letterman too, it, boy. Man. That's yes, hard. Hold up. Limitless. Take a simic cap pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a simic cap pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Welcome to the pivot. You know how it is, man. Where we start ain't where we finish. And the finish ain't always the end. I got my dog, Fred Taylor. Channing Crowder, and we are so excited to have Coach Hugh Jackson. Now, Hugh, I'm going to start off and be real. I feel like you've gotten some raw deals in the league. And I know, you know, a lot of times people attribute that to our race, to mm -hmm. our color, to mm -hmm. the allegiance we feel to one another. But I know how to look at a guy that's in, in Oakland and doesn't have a losing season. I know how to look at a guy that's in Cleveland and deals with circumstances and, and, and things that doesn't say he was put in the best situation to succeed. When you think back on your NFL head coaching career, you know, do you feel like you were put in positions to succeed at all times in all organizations? No, I don't. I mean, obviously in Oakland, there's no question I was. I mean, I was Al Davis's last head coach. But you succeeded, though, there Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. And yeah. I had an unbelievable relationship with him. Okay. And most coaches at 8 and 8 don't get fired. Mike Tomlin, who I believe is a Hall of Fame coach, unbelievable the thing coach. they constantly say about him is he doesn't have losing seasons, Absolutely. which you didn't. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting because there, uh, the last game of the regular season, we were playing to host a playoff game. Okay. We were playing the Chargers at home. And we just didn't get it done. Okay. But at the same time, Mark Davis was going to take over the team. How involved he had been to that part, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I know he wasn't around much. But I think he was relying on others to help him make decisions. Okay. And I think what happened was they made a decision to go in a different direction. Right. Which is understandable. I mean, you got to start fresh, want to start fresh. But normally... But he, I, hear, I hear you fall, start but fresh, right When though? you fall, this is the hard part. I understood that, but okay. what was hard for me is I couldn't get another job anywhere. Wow. So no, that's what was interesting. So, normally, so you're talking about like just from a head coaching yes. standpoint. Okay. So now when you leave from a head coach, you normally, okay, you get let go, you normally go be an offensive coordinator. 100%. Okay. Okay. If you've been a head coach, yeah. you fall right now. Or you go that. coach the quarterback somewhere. Well, that wasn't the case. I had to get a lifeline thrown to me by my best friend, Marvin Lewis, mm -hmm. to say, Hugh, come coach on defense. Mm -hmm. Wow. I coached on defense. I coached in the secondary, and it was assistant special teams coach. Well, the thing is, though, if you can coach, you can coach. Absolutely. If you can coach ball, you can coach ball. No doubt. But, but you shouldn't have had to do there that, you though. There you go. You that's, feel me? That's my point. And so I think for minority coaches, that's hard. Because if you ascend to these top level, become a head coach on offense, where do you go when it, when it doesn't work out? You, you come down one notch. You're supposed to. The opportunity is still there. They, they come down to OC or yes. DC whatever that might be, but it's not so much for for the minority coach. Absolutely. And, and that's a shame. And, and coach, what are like, is there anything more you could do? Like, do you look at it? Because it, once there's a problem, you're looking at it like, I'm a head coach and I'm not getting these, I'm not getting a coordinator opportunity like most people do. Mm -hmm. Like, so the problem's there. Right. And we know the problem's there. Right. And so do you do more? Like, do you reach out? Like, what, what happens from that, from the standpoint when you sitting at home chilling, drinking this, Amazing tequila. Bro, like it's you so fine. <laughs> so fine. Because, like, you sit at home chilling, like, what is the next step? Like, what more did you have to do than the coach that had that opportunity? Well, the next step is, is that you do. You reach out to your peers, right? You start calling and letting people know you're available, that you want to coach. Normally, when you get let go head, as a head coach, that coach has to make a difficult decision. Does he really want to go coach again, or does he need a chance to just exhale for okay. a minute? Well, I didn't need a chance to exhale. It was my first year. We're yeah, eight, one we're year, eight and eight. Bro. Yeah, yeah. We were eight and eight, and we had some major players get hurt, and Darren McFadden and Carson Palmer. Yeah. I mean, it was difficult, okay, because Jason Campbell was playing extremely well. He gets hurt. And you have Darren McFadden gets hurt, and we have some other receivers get hurt. We have some guys on defense get hurt. So I understood it, but I thought we were going to get a chance to see it through because for two years in a row, 
with me being there, we became eight and eight. So the mm -hmm. year before on offense, we went from 31st to sixth. Right. And then the next year, we're in the top 10 in offense, losing our quarterback with Carson Palmer coming in. I mean, look at a guy like Matt LaFleur, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Matt LaFleur gets the Green Bay job, and the Tennessee Titans are 27th in offense. No, I didn't, I didn't say that wrong. Not second or seventh. They're 27th. Mm -hmm. And he becomes the head coach. Do you think a lot of times that's because of familiarity, right? And so, because like, because I'm always trying to distance myself from racism, right? In mm -hmm. the sense of ownership, mm -hmm. and and the way that they see executives and the way executives see coaches. And you see a guy like Matt Lafleur who inherits a, a Aaron Rodgers. I can't coach offense. <laughs> I can coach damn Aaron Rodgers. Absolutely, you can. Right. And so when when you look at the way hiring takes place in the NFL and you talk about, okay, I'm a head coach at Oakland that goes eight and eight with all the difficulties that I have. Dan Quinn, mm -hmm. head coach in Atlanta, he's obviously done it. He did a great job. Right away, he's the DC in Dallas. Guess what he is right now? A head coaching candidate. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the disconnect between executives and the minority head coaches as it is opposed to the white head coaches? I think it's very obvious, Ryan. Uh, we don't look like them. Mm. People are really interested in hiring people that they have um, something connected to them. Okay. And I'm not gonna just make it about race. No, no, I, I totally understand all, what you're saying. But at the same time, it looks that way. Right. right. I mean, and that's unfair uh, because for the minority, my minority brothers, they struggle to get these opportunities. I struggle to get these opportunities. I mean, I was the coach of the year in Cincinnati, pro football writers coach of the year. Right. I go to Cleveland and I will say this because I mean it. So the same people that were a part of me being one in 31 are the same people that's running the organization today. So that tells you they must've did something right. Mm -hmm. How can they still be there if I couldn't be there? Let me read a quote. I think I became the fall guy because that was the narrative. The truth needs to come out for other minority coaches. Mm -hmm. They need to know the pitfalls out there. My story has affected some of their futures. So when you look at the rebellious players, the Antonio Browns and any players that have been outspoken, right, mm -hmm. about the NFL and what they believe is considered being blackballed, right? With that, a lot of these players, there's no coming back from that. Oh, yeah. Here you are at an HBCU in Grambling. I know you're going to do your thing. Uh, and I know you have aspirations to continue, at, maybe at some point, mm -hmm. to get back to, you know, the upper, upper echelon because you're an amazing coach, an amazing leader. And I think you're a great motivator as well. You aspire to get back in the NFL at some point. Do you think you've been completely blackballed mm. out of that league? I do. I don't think there's a chance for me to go back. At any position, no you? No, because if, if it was, I would have already done it. I'm gonna say it again, I was pro football writers, offensive coach of the year in 2015. Okay. So you at Cleveland for two and a half years with minimal talent, not very good. And finally, when you get talent, because you can't overcome the losing the You're first out. two years, you never survive as the head coach through losing. It just doesn't work that way. How much say did you have in really? getting that talent? Really? No, I mean, I, 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 no, I, I, I think people I need to hear that, though, Freddie. Yeah, right. That's, that's a great pieces, question. But I, I answered it. I asked questions no, for that I had. You know, I did not have say until year three, when John Dorsey came, that I felt like my voice was heard. Because they were into a process that they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do about what me or the assistant coaches wanted or the scouts wanted. Mm -hmm. They were going to do what they did. And my disappointment it still has led them to where they are today. Yeah. You have head coaches that have certain philosophies, mm -hmm. but they don't have say in the selections and the draft mm. picks. Absolutely. Right. How right. much of that is a hindrance? I have an idea of how I want to uh, put my imprint on a football team, but you're not letting me shop for what I need. For, for example, a great yeah, example would be good. Bill Belichick. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Like, who knows that Belichick wants a Wes Welker? Right, that's real, You know, bro. in a free yeah. agency. He knows pickup. it. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows it. Yeah. Because he has that say and that reach. But well, certain coaches don't have that opportunity. Most coaches, we're master teachers, at, and we become good to be good enough to be, get head coaching jobs because of what we do. 
okay. whether you're an offensive specialist or a defensive specialist. Yeah. Why, when you become a head coach, now you don't know what it takes to put on a team to win? Within your room, mm -hmm. right, whether you're a wide receiver coach, DB coach, quarterback coach, how much say do you have on where guys are positioned in the room and who remains in the room. Like when you're in camp and you guys are in those huge meetings where mm -hmm. you're talking about personnel, mm -hmm. if I'm the DB coach, can I say, you know what? I like Ryan Clark, I like Troy Palomalu, I like this guy, I like this guy. This fifth guy, I don't need as much as I need that listen, fifth listen. corner. Listen, just cause he got on black and yellow, and yellow, stop reliving that shit, man. <laughs> Troy Palomalu, Ryan Clark, you know so Brian crazy. McFadden. Now, I recruited Ryan, uh, I recruited you Ryan in the USA. <laughs> You know what's so crazy? On, it's like man. when you hang around dudes who didn't win Super Bowls, oh, like they, oh, oh, like they can't ever Here draw goes. back on that. Here it comes. Freddie, they carried back. Ryan to the Super Bowl. Uh, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> your team, you were so sorry, and your team was so sorry, they couldn't carry you to the Super Bowl. <laughs> it was the AFC Championship game. It was the Baltimore Ravens against the Pittsburgh Steelers. There was a guy sitting in this room that hit Willis McGahee mm. in the middle of the field, and I thought something bad happened. Changed the game. It was this man hitting You need those moments. Because, yeah. and I never thought I would see it coming, mm -hmm. because we all know Ryan wasn't the biggest of guys, mm -hmm. but that no, man Why you was, gotta do that, Hugh? That man was tough. Mm -hmm. No, he had a big yeah, heart. No, he, he didn't have a big heart, but he has a little body. <laughs> but that's okay. He played the game. I, I, I can vouch for but that. But, you know, he played the game the way it was meant to be played. And obviously, and he played with some really good players. Played with dogs. But, but Coach, have, have you ever seen the movie Life? Oh, yes, I have. With, with Can't Get Right when he got the... <laughs> when that dumb, dumb mistake. I don't think Ryan's eyes were open. I just think he ran up on Willis and just... So here's what... So, so, here's the, so, you, so here's what's crazy. And you know players, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, y'all guys know, too. It's like we're the most self-aware people in the world. Yes. Which also makes us insecure. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so, like, not being drafted, I always felt like my positives, I had to accentuate. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, doing some stuff for Mo Wells and his DBs and different things like that. And so the drill I had him doing was, I was like, okay, you went to Alabama, I want you to go draw your favorite blitz, mm -hmm. right? So he draw the blitz and I'd call another one's name. I was like, I want you to go draw it now. Because to me it said, it tells me how well you can explain yes. what you've done and for the next person, it tells me how well you can regurgitate it. Mm -hmm. Can you digest it and yes. give it back, yes. right? And so everybody that got on the board, I always knew more about it than them. And mm -hmm. I would ask them extra questions and be like, okay, did you listen to me ask him this? Did he say this? Okay, what about when it goes in motion? And what I always explain to people is, I knew what I wasn't. I knew I wasn't tall. I knew I wasn't big. I knew I wasn't fast, but I was smart, right? Like if I saw it, I never forgot it. And I knew what I was tough. And so my thing was, if it was ever an opportunity where I had to show if I was tougher than a Fred Taylor, if I was tougher than a Channing Crowder, I had to do that. Like, I had to win. Yes. And if I couldn't win, I had to knock myself out trying. The same thing. When we went to walkthroughs after the meetings, I was loud as hell. I made every check because I needed people to know, like, that was my positive. Mm -hmm. And I think in the league, mm -hmm. and especially as a coach, right, mm -hmm. we all find a way to survive. Oh, yeah. right. Like, every day is an interview. Mm -hmm. and you're trying to find a way to survive. So for you, Hugh, when you know the perception of mm -hmm. African-American coaches, mm -hmm. when you know the difference in evaluating mm -hmm. the success of African-American coaches, like right now, Mike Tomlin is still a head coach for one reason. He's never had a losing season. Absolutely. And that's the level of excellence they have to have. What sort of pressure does that put on a head coach, though, to know that you can't fail, right? Because we've seen coaches get opportunities to fail, right? and then eventually they say, you know what? If they were to fire that coach then, he never gets to that point, like a, like a Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. But you know what, Ryan? It's bigger than that. So think wow. about what you men just said. Okay. So why would a minority coach ever take a job or put himself in a situation where he's going to lose? That makes no sense. Because he can't get a job otherwise, though, Hugh. No, no, but my point is, but think about it. But no, I said put himself in a situation where he's set up to lose. He's not gonna do that. It, the jobs are too hard to come by. And in your contract, it doesn't say lose. You get paid for winning. 
Period. You so you're to try. Thank you. So you're not going to put yourself and take a job where you know you're going to lose. You, nobody's going to do that. Nobody that's a minority coach would ever do that. And if he did, he's fighting to make sure he doesn't lose. And Ryan, you brought up about the players in the room. Mm -hmm. Do you get a chance to make those decisions? All depends on what the head coach's contract says. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody got to understand. It's, yeah. it, it, you, can, you can say those things, but the voice is determined by what's in that contract. Right. For the head coach, the assistants can say whatever they want. That, that that might not mean nothing. Coach, you've been in that situation, and I'm so this. I'm intrigued by this. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the Bill Belichick pool, you don't have the guys that get to pick the groceries and make the dinner. Like, how does that happen on draft night after free agency? They walk into Hugh Jackson's office and tell you, "This is what you have." Like, there's nothing, like, you have no pull on that stuff. They draft, they free, they pick up free agents, they give them this crazy money, and they tell you, deal with this? Coach them. You signed up to coach the team. Your contract says coach the team. Make a decision about the 53. The general manager has final say. Upper management has final say. But we're going to do it collaborative. We're going to do it together. Okay. Yep. That's the word, but it's not collaborative. What's the conversation like on a draft night, though, or like through the draft process? It, it sounds collaborative. It sounds like we're working together, mm -hmm. but you're not part of those midnight conversations that upper management is having. You play spades, right? Play oh, spades. I do. I'm pretty you good at it. You look across the table you got and say, impossible? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got teamed up with this month. <laughs> like, this is the hand I'm dealt. I, I, I got I to gotta play it. But that's you know, what we but do. The whole time, you, you're like, oh, but that's what we mean. You know, Minority men do. We take the hand that's dealt. We go, we're going to show you. But let me tell you something. Minority men, I'll tell you right now, don't do that. Mm. If you're going to sit where I've sat, don't do it. It always seems, and, and this is totally because the way I feel sometimes, mm -hmm. that like Mike T got put in a great position, I think, because of ownership. Oh, yeah. Right? It's, it's the Roonies, and they had the Rooney rule. And they gave Mike T the opportunity. He wasn't the favorite, but they listened to him and said, this fits Pittsburgh, right? And so he got that exceptional opportunity. I feel like it's a lot of opportunities that are lose-lose situations. And then as they go forward with those coaches, they don't do the right things to help them succeed. Mm -hmm. Do you think minority coaches, though, have the opportunity to be Josh McDaniels and say, you know what? I know I got Indy. I don't want it because it's not right for me. Or do you feel like when a minority coach does get that opportunity to be a head coach, he has to take that job right now? He always, he almost has to take it. Okay. Because it might not ever come around. Like, see, and, that, and that's, and that's and a that's scary what's hard. thing. But you just said something. Like, yeah. I hate to do this, but I got to go there. Because you just talked about Pittsburgh. And Mike is a good friend, one of the most, uh, one of the best coaches probably in the history of the league. Mm -hmm. Where is Mike Tomlin's tree? I agree with that. And I'm not mad at him for it. No, he's because, no, because here's the difference. I love him. Mike did what he needed to do to be successful. I'm not mad about that. I can never. If Mike says, this is my blueprint on how we're going to win at Pittsburgh, and these are the kind of men I need to lead that, then that's what you do. I'm not running from that. But when you look in the AFC North, you think about Marvin Lewis, mm -hmm. 17 years. I don't just Mike agree. Tomlin, John Harbaugh. I've worked at almost every place in that division other than Pittsburgh. But my point is, we talk about helping and making a difference. It takes, in my opinion, someone like Mike Tomlin to say, and he interviewed me, he interviewed Pep, he interviewed several people. So they say they, they say Austin's up for the DC job now. That'd be great. That I hope he gets it. No, 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 Hugh, for me, because that's I, I I love Mike T. Like that's my friend. Mm -hmm. I feel like that has to happen. I feel like that's the one thing missing from his coaching legacy, right? To, to add an African-American into the group of the next head coaches. And this may be rude. Bruce Arians, in mm -hmm. my opinion, has more of an effect on the next African-American head coach than a Mike Tomlin does. How can we, as minority men, raise up our other minority men if we don't hire them. 
You brought up something, that's why I put my hand up. I said, I need to be next, because I was in kindergarten hey, no, again. What I, what I thought that was, though, I thought you was praising. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I'm praising. I've been in church a lot. Okay. Church. Uh, Your hands, are, you. you got big hands, too, bro. You, you got, got little got, everything. I, 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 Get the hell out of here. You First off, you, you, it's an HBCU show. I'm okay. going to let that go. We haven't even went there yet. Yeah. I'm going to let that go. <laughs> we had there to say, I got one more thing, Coach. You said something that gets to me, and I've argued this for years. Coaching trees. Mm -hmm. Josh McDaniels went to Denver, failed, ran back to Daddy Belichick. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to stay. Indy, he didn't even want to touch. Mm -hmm. Matt Patricia failed. Mm -hmm. Bill O'Brien ran the Texans into the ground. Mm -hmm. As a successful coach, you said the phrase coaching tree, and that's what set me off. What does a coaching tree mean to a coach? To me, what it means is that the head coach has developed his assistants to put them in position so they can go chase their goals and dreams and aspirations. And that's why you're in the National Football League. Some guys have aspirations of becoming a head coach. Some guys don't. Some guys don't want that pressure. Some guys don't want that opportunity because I, I really believe when you look at the minority coaches, 101 year history of the league and it's been 1920 now what does that tell you i don't especially i don't want to go over there because all of a sudden i might be unemployed yeah or my value may plummet way down and where i go from there so i think it's very very tough but coaching trees of a marvin lewis where you talk about Leslie Frazier, mm. Hugh Jackson, Mike Zimmer, mm. uh, uh, Jay Gruden. You know what I'm saying? I mean, John Harbaugh. I, I come off a part of history, too. So are you just talking about coaching trees of African-American coaches in the sense of coaches they allow to be head coaches or African-American coaches they allow to be head coaches? Because you think about a guy like a, um, but bro, you a Tony Dungy. He just said it. 101 years, there's only 20 trees for African-American coaches. So I'm saying, I'm saying you think fall. about like, like a Tony Dungy, you think about like a Jim Caldwell. Absolutely. Right? A Lovey Smith. Yes. A Herm Edwards. Yes. Mike Tomlin there you go. down the line. But Ryan, here's the, the key. Look at this. They have those shows where all those other guys sit at the table and they fell off their trees and they talk about it. Mm-hmm. I ain't seen a show with Marvin Lewis in history. But Marvin Lewis' tree is extensive, though. Absolutely. I haven't seen, I, I, I've seen Tony Junji's, I want to believe I have, but I haven't seen every minority coach to put it out there yeah. to show that these men yeah, have done their, this, they've done their job. Is it about championships, though? Is it? Right? Is it? If we're talking about the issue we're talking about right now, it's not about championships. It's about opportunity. You, 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 I work in the business. I know right? you do. People treat me, and I'm just gonna be straight up, like the woke Negro. Because when it comes to opportunity to talk about minority coaches, right, minority executives, minority owners, I'm always on 10 toes for us. Mm -hmm. And I'm never going to change, mm -hmm. right? Because I know that it's 75% plus of us that play the game, right? Like, I never change on that. Mm -hmm. And so my issue always is when you are Mike Tomlin, can you make hires to make sure your people your, your people are elevated, or do you have to make hires that allow you to keep your job? I don't think Mike has made hires that allows him to keep his job. I think Mike has a... I feel like he's made hires to make sure that his team can win football games. Yeah, absolutely. That's because what I feel At the end like. of the day, that's really what he's responsible for. Right. Now, it, now what, what I hope he does is that he has really vetted everything out and made sure that this is the right guy for him. And okay. I said this earlier, I cannot get mad for a guy for that because let's just be honest, all of this is about winning and losing. It's about winning. Yes. You gotta win. Yes. Dude, yes. you said it. Like yes. the Raiders, you shouldn't have been fired. Cleveland, you, you, absolutely. 1 31. You, like, you just said it. You don't you know win. What I'm absolutely. Winning and hiring minorities, can that be somewhere in the middle? What makes it difficult, and I hate to keep using Mike as an example, because I, I don't think it's fair. Because he is seen as the most successful. So you know why you gotta use him? Because he's all that's left. That's what I'm saying. That's so, the problem. So here's he's my all point. that's left. So I'm gonna say this to you: If Mike Tomlin doesn't hire one, why should anybody else? Mm. Mm. If Mike doesn't say this guy's good enough to work for me, I'm the winningest minority coach that's out here right now. Yeah. If I can't find one, then why should he find one? Ooh. They can't find one. You, you're not, you're not going to find, and they're out, and they're out there. So how do you feel about a guy like Bruce Arians, 
who, who has does find who them. has B left. Come on. Right? Who has Todd. Come on. Right? Keep, who has Goody. Keep, on, keep Goody. Armstrong. Yeah. Right. And all of these guys in Tampa, and I, and I, and I made mention of this. Um, I worked on Monday at the Super Bowl. And they asked me, what was your most impressive thing about the weekend? I said, the fact that other than Bruce Arias and Tampa Bay, everyone in leadership positions were African Americans. Mm. And what I said was, it showed that we could be leaders, right? Because, Hugh, there's a lot of people that know X's and O's. Absolutely. Like, I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. I can get on the board right now with you, and me and you can have a great time. Absolutely. You can talk about X's and O's, and I can be like, oh, yeah, Hugh, you know, if I see you do this, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. But it's a different thing to lead men. There you go. You know what I mean? It's, it's a battle. It's, I remember, bro. So my last year was in Washington. I'm 35. It's Jay Gruden's first year. Robert Griffin is a freaking freak show. Mm -hmm. He does something one game, and Jay Gruden is like trying to work around Robert Griffin, but talk about him. So I stand up. I say, hey, Jay. I was like, for real, bro? Like, stop this. I said, we all know who the f you talking about, right? You talking about him. And he was like three rows down. And I was like, I don't really care. It's like walk around him. I said, if you got an issue with him, if there's something he's doing that won't help us win, then say it. And if you won't say it, then don't bring it in front of us. Because when you bring it in front of us, it feels fake. Mm -hmm. As an African-American coach, do you feel like you can call out all 53 of the guys in the room in the, in, in, as a head coach oh, in the league? Absolutely, I could. Because I earned that. Because I was always transparent. Mm -hmm. You have to be that way. What was your office like, though? Because the thing I loved about Mike T, so it's me, my 12th year in the league, right? My 11th year is my best year ever. 12th year, man, we had like bad, we had some bad coaching, some, some bad corners, you know. We played New England. Mm -hmm. I ain't gonna lie, I played bad here. I was trying to do too much. We're too little. I, <laughs> Channing, what you say? I hit harder than you. You don't you have didn't one. Hit. Channing, now Channing, Channing, listen. Channing, RC, you don't have RC, one hit on your RC, RC, just listen. Harder than any of mine. You lines. were 85 yards deep. Channing, I probably have as many tackle for losses as you do. How much money you want to bet? How much money Hugh, you want to bet? You coached this since Hugh. Yes, I did. Hugh, is it true or is it false that I can make a tackle on a run play at the line of scrimmage from the middle of the field? Oh, it's true. I watched him. Him watch him do it. And Hugh, when you went to play action and tried to throw NCAA mm -hmm. a pump scene, mm -hmm. would I not be in the middle? Oh, he would. He would. And I Hugh, got, can I, I give, give it to him? Can That's I give one? Yes, you can. Am I okay? I, I, you got to give it to him. And Hugh, when you watch film, did you ever say, who is this sixth grader <laughs> running around in safety? <laughs> so speaking of sixth graders, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they never stop. See, I got a speed. I want y'all to know. Because I want y'all to know. I need you to lie. I got to understand. These other two guys on the set. Now, Channing, running backs I used to coach, we didn't want to go take him on in the hole. Because Channing was going to run through you, over the top of you. And when Fred got the ball, when Fred, when the ball went to Fred's hand, everybody turned and looked the other way because everybody was afraid he was going to go score. First off, they were scared of Channing's teeth, nothing else. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to say this, though. I'm just being oh real. I'm, it's, it's scary. They were scared that if they touched you, they'd get sick and lose their organs. That's no, wrong. <laughs> you had COVID in 01. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were patient Shut zero. Shut up, motherfucker. The Albert Monkey. Wait, the Albert Monkey was supposed to be an HBCU show. Let me say this. I'm so glad me and Fred started to correspond before <laughs> we got to this point. For sure. Because right. I would always, I would be like, man, people would ask me, who's the best running back you ever played with? I was like, damn, Fred Taylor gave me fits. He was something. What he could do was, was just, it was just special to me. Like Put you this suck. man in the Hall of Fame. I agree. Yeah. But I have a question though, Hugh. Hugh, we talked about all these NFL head coaching jobs and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You went through all of that, and we've kind of got to the difficulties of being an African American head coach in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say this in a disrespectful way. It would almost seem that you are overqualified to be the head coach right now at an HBCU, but we do see the Deons and Eddie Georges, mm -hmm. and now we add you to that. 
What is that now adding to the HBCU experience? Mm. I'm at Grambling State University, where one of the greatest minority coaches in the history of football coach, mm -hmm. Eddie Robinson. Yes, yes sir. sir. One of the best ever. Walked those halls, led those players, created environments for those players to be great. So when I thought about, okay, Hugh, maybe somebody, my phone might ring and somebody say, you get a chance to be a position coach in the National Football League, or you have a chance to go be the head coach. Big man. Put on the shoes, go in the museum where Eddie, they have an Eddie Robinson museum on campus. They should. We, I understand, they should. I understand so, the legacy. So how do you not go take that program, watching what Dion's done, watching what Eddie will do mm -hmm. and say, how do I make Grambling State University better than both of those? Okay, so yeah. with that mindset and the legacy and it's, you're painting the picture, right? Mm -hmm. A minute ago, we, we talked about the challenges of, of a minority coach inheriting uh, a garbage team, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. Right. And now you're here at HBCU where you lack resources. We got to do something about that. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I recently saw Eddie George post something about Hammer Strength in their new locker room. Absolutely. We got to get these companies that are able and capable to support these colleges behind, you know, people like you. You're going to laugh, Fred. You know what I, I'm saying? When I took the job on December 10th, probably December 14th, you guys go check it. How was the interview I, process for that? It was amazing because awesome. Dr. Travian Scott, who's the AD, okay. and President Gallo, who's our president, want to take Grambling State University football to a whole different level. How? You don't seek out a Hugh Jackson if you don't. Absolutely, they want to skip. How? Be but because How? it's called resources, it's just what you said. So I did the unthinkable, because that's just the way my mind thinks. I went on Instagram. Mm. I put out a post on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Use by name. All the Graham fam, I need your help. Mm -hmm. Come on and help me make this university what you guys want it to be, which is great. Yeah. Let me tell you something. My Instagram box, whatever you want to call it, started to flood. Mm. I've had people walk in with TVs, checks, mm. whatever you can think of. So here's my point. I get tired of hearing what HBCUs can't do. Right. It's time to get out of that. What they can do. Thank you. Quit talking about what we can't do. Yeah, do we need to do it better? Yeah, does the process need to be better and all that? Yes. Yeah. But there's too many alumni out there that want to see their school thrive, just like at Florida. So we talked about pressure. Yes. And the only time I really speak up is when something hits me, I just get passionate. You know, I'm always Come on, I know you, in, you right? know I me. Mean? Yes. But pressure. I love it. Right? As a minority coach on the other level, you the same this, pressure. You it's a different pressure. I feel like it's a different you type you have of pressure. But, but it's still a greater pressure. They want to prove the Channing Crowders of the world wrong. Yeah. Absolutely. I right. do too. And, and I want to prove you wrong. I want to prove you. him wrong because I heard what he said about HBCU. Correct. Yeah. So I know what that he pressure. said. And Hugh, you're oh, made I love can it. I say this, Hugh? Absolutely. I'm going to say this, though. As a kid that grew up in Louisiana, mm -hmm. in New Orleans, that frequented oh, the man. Bayou Classic. Yes. It was the culmination of football yes. in my young life. It was the what of football? Culmination. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and he said it right. We're going to teach these kids at the HBCU the that word. You too. know, like it was in no disrespect to anybody else. It was black excellence yes. to me. Right. You know, it was the best we could offer in football and entertainment yes. and in culture. How much pressure do you feel to bring that back? And also now you're competing with a Jackson State that has a Dion, a Tennessee State that has a Eddie George. And now you bring Hugh Jackson into this, who's a former NFL head coach, period. No matter if it's 20 years down the line, that's always what will be attached to your name. Is there a pressure associated with that in the sense that I want to get Gramlin back to the Eddie Robinson days? That's all I, that's the reason why I took the job. That's what my expectation is, is to get it back. It's so crazy. It, we talked to Tyson Bordeaux, he said the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, here's the fun part. You guys talk about myself and Eddie and Prime. Dion. Prime, yeah. There's Willie Simmons. That's at that FAMU. That's, yeah, Eric Dooley. That's Eric Dooley, who left Prairie View a and That Love was a Southern. Keep it coming. Who's a heck of a coach. Keep it coming. There's Coach Maynard, who's at Alabama. Oh, He's I, a my heck teammate, of a coach. Reggie Barlow. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, Reggie listen. B. I don't think we're doing it right. Because let me tell you something. Those men, they can coach. Right. 
Those guys are great football coaches. They might not have had the aspiration of going to coach in the National Football League. Maybe this was their dream right where they are right now, and they're doing it well. So, yeah, I need to beat the Deion Sanders. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I need to beat all you guys. Well, you're talking about try to get, try to continue Eddie Robinson's Absolutely. legacy. Legacy. Mm -hmm. And you're also trying to win football games. Mm -hmm. So you got to put an offense together. You got to do everything the other coaches do, but you're also carrying that torch that you have to carry. Isn't that tougher on you? No. Isn't that is, that's no. not a harder job you, than, you, the, than the normal coach that's no. that's coaching that you know somewhere that doesn't have that pressure? No, because that don't bother me. These are big shoulders. I've been through the war. I know what this is like. I failed at Cleveland. Mm. Yeah. According to what people said. No, according to what you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. I did say that because you know what? Sometimes you gotta play the game, right? Yeah. You know, I didn't fail at Cleveland. Are you kidding me? Go back and look at the team. Mm -hmm. Go back and look and ask me who had the decision to put them on the field. Okay. I have my own algorithm as a football coach. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I know what players it takes. How was I coaching them in Cincinnati, but yet all of a sudden in Cleveland, I don't know what it takes to win? Right. Mm. Yeah. No, it don't mm. work that way. Yeah, I, I didn't all of a sudden fall off the turnip truck and forget football in a freaking year. I know what it takes to win. You think that I was going to put quarterbacks on my team that we had on our team mm -hmm. in the beginning? Mm -hmm. Preach. Well, yeah, come no. on now, let's wake it. up. Look, you know, the, you know the media, Ryan, as well as anybody. They yeah. can, once you start that fire, it takes off and run. Yes. And that's the narrative that everybody can create when they want to. And, that, and that's you, that flame and, he was talking yeah, about. Yeah, the flame. But he was one more thing. This, this is my argument, and this is my thing, and I keep putting it. I put it on everybody. Yes. The resources, because you've seen big schools. I'm you right, now. I'm the, going. The, listen, you're going to Instagram to try to get people. Money. I have money. No. So if that's what it takes, if that's what it takes, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get Grambling State University to be right on the echelon of where you think Florida is and everybody else. And I'm going to ask all of this Graham fam, go in your pocket. Come help us be the best we can be. Because that's all you can do is ask. All they can do is say no. And, and how, yeah. could you not, how could you not support that? I mean, I'm here, sitting here as reserve. This is just my demeanor. But I hear the passion oh, and the fact that he wants to not only get the HBCU and that in Grambling State, no, back on the map. He understands the challenges that's presented. So passionate, though. The, the passion is there, but the pride, he's he's tucked aside. Fred, you know what I really want, you three? I want these minority coaches who feel like they can't go get it in the National Football League. Come on over here. I love it. That's yes, the sir. thing. Come on over that's here what you gotta do. to the HBCU world. That's what you got to do, bro. Where these are your people. You get to coach the players that everybody says that sometime in the National Football League, you can't coach. Like the thing we talk about here, obviously it's the name of the show, it's about the pivot. Mm -hmm. You're a coach that built his way up to be a head coach in the NFL. Mm -hmm. and now, twice. Twice. Mm -hmm. And now you hit a roadblock mm -hmm. where it's not offensive coordinator, it's not quarterback coach, these things. So you made the ultimate pivot to now being an HBCU head coach. The first one that's ever done it. So tell me why that pivot's important to you. Because I think it's going to open the door for these minority coaches that really want to be head coaches and know they have the skill to do it, mm -hmm. to say, wait a minute, I can pivot from the National Football mm. League. If they're not going to allow me to do it here, mm -hmm. watch what Hugh Jackson just did mm -hmm. and watch that program soar and watch the resources start to flow into Grambling State because they do have a Hugh Jackson there and people want to be a part of that. Oh, by the way, Grambling State used to be the King Kong of HBCU football. Hugh, I'm, then I'm why can't they be again? I'm going to close it like this, Hugh, because uh, I think this is vital. Uh, what's the impetus? Is it the young men? Or is it the HBCU? Is it the legacy? Or is it the fact to try and show, approve that you can do it and be successful on that level? I wanted to be transparent Absolutely. that people that are seeing this, parents, mm -hmm. subscribers, mm -hmm. viewer, whoever it might be, I want them to know why he's doing this. Because one, it could be 
I want these young men to come here and have an amazing experience and, and let them realize that they're not missing out on anything. Right. You know, we By have going to power five schools. Power five, exactly. He and just how said, do you do that, though? What he legacy. just said is true. Like, this is not what is about, it really about. This is not about me proving anything to anyone. You, it got to be about you no, proving no, something, no, though. No, no, Okay. Because I'm 56 years old. You look good, boy. Yeah, thank Damn, you. Damn, black don't thank crack. Thank you. Thank you. Dog, I've already did all that. Here's the key. Why can't our minority young men okay. go to an HBCU, get a great education, and graduate and play great college football? Mm. Be in an environment to where they can grow as young men on and off the field and be prepared to go play and chase their goals in the National Football League because we create the right environment. Why can't they do that? Yeah. That's what it's about. Dude, bottom line, man, you showed us what pivoting is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, where you start isn't where you finish. No. And sometimes when you think you've got to the end of the line, there's more road to go. So, man, we appreciate you. Uh, all the best to Grambling. Can your boy get like sideline tickets to the Bayou listen, Classic though? Listen, here's my invitation to you, man. We're going to have a spring game. Can I come? I would love nothing more than for you men to be there and announce our spring game. Done. Wow. Done. I'm because now. you know what? Is the band going to be there too though? You better believe they are. Done. And I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> because I want people to believe that they can be Ryan Clark mm. and Channing Crowder yeah, and Fred Taylor that they can someday have their own podcast after having an unbelievable career in the National Football League. Oh, that's done, man. That's so what I be need live. you, man, for so many different reasons. Because I want these young men to see you can have success in a lot of different ways. Yeah, yeah the National Football League might be their reality, mm -hmm. but it might not be. Correct. Yeah. That's the real. And where are you going to pivot in your life as a young Ooh. man there we mm -hmm. go. to become successful? Hey, oh. so now I'm going to end this. This is the first time we ever did this. This is damn Hugh Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. All love. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on a mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh,